Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy is sponsored by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with the intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Products include Westlaw, Practical Law, and Firm Central legal practice management software for small law firms. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the Greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is Life Illuminated. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan, acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. A Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. And welcome. Access to Democracy returns. Uh, I'm your host, Alan Miller, although we have been breaking in some new hosts of late, and so you'll see a bunch of guest hosts uh, as we wind this down in the 18th year, which we're about to commence. In any event, we have a new first-time guest today, Stephen Munzer, an attorney, a uh, retired attorney, who is also the author of a book, a novel, based loosely on reality, called Farewell Berlin. We have a copy of it here. And it's, it's heavy, but I can hold it up for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's 500 pages. And uh, you get a good shot of it there. And we'll have contact during the show as to where, if you're interested, you can get a copy of Farewell Berlin. Stephen, welcome. Thank you. Now, how did this book come about? Because it's an interesting story. Well, it came about uh, as a result of my desire to uh, empathize and understand what my parents and other members of my family must have gone through in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, my parents uh, we were able to flee Germany uh, in 39, so it was uh, actually a year after Kristallnacht. Uh, they got to America through the largesse of uh, an aunt of my mother's who had emigrated in 1929 and signed an affidavit for them. And so they got out what uh, my parents described as the last boat out of Rotterdam. Well, 1939 started really the, the, the Nazi attack on uh, Poland right. and uh, kicked off uh, all the horrors of World War II uh, referred to often as the Holocaust. Right. And uh, your parents obviously recognized a lot of the signs which by 1939 weren't so hard to recognize as your neighbors were disappearing and things like that. Exactly. Uh, my mother's uh, family lived in a smaller city named Swickau, which was in, uh, still is in Saxony in southeastern Germany, which became part of eastern Germany after the war. And my grandparents were ardent Zionists. And in 1933, after Hitler came to power, they sent uh, my uncle and an aunt, so uh, two of my mother's siblings. My mother was the oldest. She didn't go. They sent them to Palestine on their own. And my uh, grandparents stayed. They owned a, a small, what you would call a general store in Swickow, uh, lived above it, 
and were able to, you know, maintain a business until Kristallnacht in November of 1938 when their business was destroyed and my grandfather was arrested and taken to Buchenwald. Now, uh, the, the history had always been a little vague to me being far away from my family, my mother's family. My father's family is a whole other story, but my mother's family, uh, they're in Israel and actually uh, my wife and I and my sister went to Israel this uh, fall, last fall sort of a family reunion. And I got a little more detailed account of my grandparents' uh, uh, ordeal getting out of Germany because they did get out and made it to Palestine and actually both died there. So, so your grandfather from Buchenwald somehow or other got yes, out? Yes, well, the, the uh, Crystal, uh, you know, as you well know, separating the death camps of the Holocaust from the you know, pre-1942 issues, uh, they're two different things, although it's a, it's, a, it's a continuum that gets ever more horrifying as time goes on. But Kristallnacht uh, was uh, a German-wide attack the on The Night Jews. of Broken Glass. Correct. It's when the brown shirts were turned loose to destroy Jewish businesses and at least 21 uh, of the religious institutions, synagogues, etc. I think 200 people, 200 Jews died, but several thousand were also rounded up and sent to various concentration camps. Yeah, at at that least, time. at least that many, and maybe, yeah. maybe many more. Uh, mm. And so the notion was, uh, you could get; they would let you go if someone could come and say, you know, we've got papers to get you out. So my uh, uncle, who at that time would have been 18 years old, and I just learned this recently, went from Palestine, made this arduous trip to Germany, and was able to get my grandfather out, and, you know, risking being arrested himself and throwing into a camp. And then they emigrated, and uh, my, my grandmother was permanently... Uh, uh, psychologically destroyed over the, over the whole thing. I mean, I only met her once, and she was very old at the time. Well, old, not for our standards, but in her middle 70s, and looked like a 90-year-old. So she had been, you know, greatly destroyed because their, bus their business was totally decimated. And we did have a copy of a deed that was forced upon my grandfather to sign over his all his property and his business and the building to this uh, Nazi functionary for a minimal amount, plus promising to pay for the damage that the Nazis had done to his building. There's a wonderful movie called The Shop on Main Street, mm -hmm. which sort of exemplifies that very story. And uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's really, really worth two hours of your life to see that marvelous movie. So, 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 the, so, so Kristallnacht was, a, was a really a, a, a strong turning point. And by then, uh, more than half of the, the Jews that lived in Berlin had, had left. Uh, those that stayed uh, either couldn't go for various reasons or were in total denial over what the situation was. Yeah, my parents, obviously, they wanted to get out. They, they, as you mentioned, the war started on September 1st of 1939 to the east, but you could still move to the west. And so they were able to get to Holland and from there uh, to New York. So you are an attorney practicing at, well, until a few years ago here in St. Paul. Uh, what prompted you to start doing the research to come up with this novel. And, w and we have to say that the, the novel is not the exact story of your parents and your family. It's a fictionalized version of a family with a lot of facts that ac actually are appropriate, but... Uh, Correct. It's, it's a historical novel, so in, in the sense that what was happening in Germany, uh, there, are, there are true events. The people who populate it, though, are fictionalized characters. I, I could never have written uh, a story of my 
my parents and, and the families there because I didn't know the stories. And that was the primary reason for me to write. Uh, they talked very little about their experiences other than a few episodes here and there. It obviously weighed very heavy on them, especially my father. My father's uh, mother uh, was lost to the Holocaust. His um, father was one of eight siblings and uh, a number of them were killed in the Holocaust. My grandfather, my father's side, died of natural causes, so, so thankfully he didn't uh, suffer uh, uh, that uh, terrible indignity. But uh, It's hard to say that he died, but he was lucky one because he yeah, didn't have because to go he through died, it. Yes, yeah. he died, so. uh, you know, naturally. Okay. But, um, so, so when did you start? When did you get the idea and when did you start doing your research and preparing to do what is a first novel? Yeah. Well, I retired in 2007 and I had always wanted to write sort of that romantic vision of, you know, uh, and being in a garret and writing and, you know, uh, but never really having done it uh, except the period of time when I traveled and kept a journal. So I, I thought that uh, what was it like for my parents? I, I, I wanted to empathize and, and find that out. So I started researching, and one of the things I started with was uh, a, a small little book uh, by a man named Herman Mollerman. And he was a shirt tail relative of my mother's who uh, had been arrested uh, uh, in, during Kristallnacht and uh, on Hitler's birthday was released. April 20th. And made it, well, I don't know that date, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> That's a date that I have not, maybe purposely not put to memory. Um, and uh, made his way uh, across uh, to, um, he went to, uh, I think he went to Brussels uh, and got caught then in the invasion and wrote about his experience moving across northern France and being evacuated with the British old soldiers at Dunkirk. And because he was German, and never mind that he was a Jew and an enemy of the Reich, was then sent to Canada and put in an internment camp. I mean, not a concentration camp, but just a camp for refugees until the war ended and then ended up living in uh, Saskatchewan and then eventually Winnipeg. And he wrote a short little book called The Fugitive. And I read that and I thought, now there's an interesting story. It's, it was so amazing to me because to meet the man, he was, he was a tiny man. He was barely five feet tall, ordinary in every way you could possibly imagine. Yet he had a story that was so incredibly intense that it was hard to even imagine. And so that, that spurred me, and I thought... Well, that, that lit the fire. Number one, a desire to be a writer. Right. Number two, a family story. Number right. three, right. the closeness of it all. So. Right. And so, and I wanted, to, I wanted to be in Berlin, because Berlin was one of the great cities of the 1920s. I mean, it was unbelievable what was achieved in, in a mere the 13 years, uh, from 1920 to 1933 you know, cabaret, you know, art, uh, you name it, it was there in Berlin. It was an open city. And that's, that's the city that my father was born and raised in. And of course, in 1933, Hitler then took power and everything started downhill, except their economy, which shot way up because of all the manufacturing of armaments in violation of the Treaty of Versailles that they were doing. Right, right. So there were all sorts of things that, <clears throat> that uh, gave a, a megalomaniac like Hitler the opportunity to arm himself and get stronger. I mean, you also have, you have to put it in the context of the period of time after the Great War. You know, it wasn't World War I yet because World War II hadn't started, so it was the Great War. The, the death toll for France and uh, England, I mean, a million, uh, close to a million soldiers, uh, Germany as well, uh, but Germany was stabbed in the back. That was, that was Hitler's uh, argument, not to mention the terrible reparations. So he was able to whip up not, uh, nationalist uh, fervor and climb to power. His only serious opposition were the communists. And as it turned out, Germany was not willing to go communist. 
And uh, so, uh, so in that context, uh, you know, uh, my father grew up uh, and uh, came to maturity. And to me, it, it seemed like a wonderful place to set a story. Uh, with uh, uh, romance and uh, some illegal activity uh, thrown in. Because it's certainly not my family's story, because I don't believe... And it's not it. a book that got written overnight, either. No. You started it in, really, 2007? 2007, uh, some, some star stops and starts, and uh, it was actually published in, in uh, January of 19, uh, 2013. So it's been out for a while. And uh, it took a long time, because uh, I'd never written before. And so I had a lot of help with my editor once I got it written. And of and course, there's good. not a lot of novels that are 500 pages either. No, it's long. It's long. But, <laughs> but uh, people tell me that it's a fast read. Uh, and the print is sort of big. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, anyone who's interested in this period of time, I recommend it. And, and, and what's amazing to me is, is that it seems that uh, World War II, uh, whether it's uh, you know, the military history, the economic history, the, the personal lives, or novels, or nonfiction, it's a constant source. Well, we're, of, we're still getting new twists yeah. on World War II here all these years later, still. <clears throat> and, you know, this is another example of, of another uh, twist, shall we say, a, another side of a story. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was fun to tell. It was fun to do. It was, well, fun may be not the right way to put it. It was, it was painful as well because you, you're reading about this, this, this noose that had been placed around uh, the necks of the collective Jewish population of Germany. And ever tightened, starting with 1933, with various uh, small little edicts like you you couldn't uh, butchers couldn't sell kosher uh, meat. Uh, in May of 1933, famously, they had the book burnings throughout Germany that really got a lot of international uh, publicity, where every supposed enemy of the Third Reich, their that book was thrown into the fire and burned. Uh, including many great classics. Yes, yes, and people you would suspect who is, had, uh, which had been written a hundred years earlier in some cases. Right, not necessarily Jewish writers. No, and right. uh, <laughs> so, and then of course in 1933, the Nuremberg Laws established that that really refined what a definition of a Jew was, and outlawed the marrying of uh, Jews and non-Jews, and the uh, uh, or even just uh, f fraternizing. And of course, that was the beginning, but things got onerous and more onerous and ultimately uh, resulted in the annihilation of six million people. Unfortunately, we look around the world today and we realize that we don't ever seem to learn. You look at what's going on in Syria now uh, with Assad, killing so many of his own people and, and people revolting and trying to uh, do what people want to do, which is really to be able to have a peaceful life and raise your family peacefully. And, and uh, it, it seems that there is something in humankind that prevents that. I know there's, there's, there's no ready answer to what should <laughs> seemingly be obvious, but uh, clearly it's not. Uh, another uh, twist that is a little, be it's beyond the scope of my book, and uh, actually it's, it's beyond the scope of my second book, which continues the story, but outside of Germany. Yeah, let's talk about that. So this covers the period from when to when? About 1932, just as, just as Weimar mm -hmm. Germany, the Republic, we, you know, popularly called Weimar, but it was really called the Republic, which was a democracy, which was terribly split. It, uh, if you think that, that our current federal government is, uh, is polarized, imagine a, uh, a Reichstag, a, a, a parliament in which you've got almost equal number of Nazis, National Socialists, and Communists, the KPD, with a, t with a small center. So nothing could be governed. 
And so the question was, who was going to ultimately prevail? Well, it, and, they, and there were brawls on the streets. I mean, it was, it was open warfare between the two uh, factions, the two political parties. Well, it was resolved uh, when Hitler was uh, appointed uh, chancellor. Yeah, I think that's a point that people should understand. He was appointed chancellor. Right. <clears throat> that, actually, that was something that, that he wanted to do. He did not want to take power in a coup d'etat. He wanted to be the legitimate leader of Germany. And, of course, it all went downhill from then. Almost immediately. So the book covers that period until? Until uh, a month after Kristallnacht. So basically December of 1938. And then uh, my second book, which I have just finished writing, which is in the process of being edited, hopefully will be out uh, soon for my next appearance on S your show. Son of Farewell Berlin. Yeah. Well. <laughs> right, right. Right now it's called Danger Road. I'm not sure if that will be the... Uh, um, the, the, ultimate, name, the ultimate, the ultimate title. title. It's a working title, and it goes uh, from that point to the end of the war. Now, is Farewell Berlin available through uh, Barnes and Noble or Amazon or places like that? No, uh, uh, I I did not seek to have it published by a publisher. I I, I self-published it. So I made it printing, and it's available through my website, which I believe was on the screen. We, we put your website up on the screen. Yeah, Absolutely. farewellberlin.com. And if someone sends me an email, I will personally uh, send a copy uh, to them. And so that's, that's uh, there's also e-books, too, through uh, Smashwords. Oh, okay. So, um, but that's, uh, it was a small run, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so the sources of your information were basically research rather than your family who were not that forthcoming with their own experiences. Correct. You know, there's a, a plethora of books written about this period. Uh, and not having ever been to Berlin, and of course it wouldn't have made any sense to go to get, uh, to research neighborhoods and what they looked like since the city was almost totally destroyed. Picture books, there's, there are many, many picture books of various neighborhoods in Berlin so you could, you could create this area by looking at pictures of, of what things look like and create sort of this ambiance and, and use maps. There's, there were some wonderful sites with uh, very detailed maps. And but did you finally get to Berlin? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Jeannie and I went to Berlin. And, Before uh, or after the book? After the book came out uh, in, uh, I think it was the... It, the same year it came out in, in 2013, I think. I, I may be wrong on the year, but after it was published. So it must have been 2013. And we spent five days there and um, uh, walked around the city. Uh, there, are, I wanted to go to the streets that I wrote about in the book. Most of the, most of the book took place in an area called Mitte, which was the central part of Berlin which was where many of the uh, Jews from Poland and Eastern Europe settled. It wasn't a ghetto, but that's where many of them were, as well as other people, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't ghettoized. Uh, and I wanted to walk there. There was a, a synagogue there called the New Synagogue, Neue Synagogue, and it was Moorish designed with beautiful domes. It was a beautiful synagogue, and it was spared destruction uh, during Kristallnacht because the police officer that was guarding it refused to let the SA destroy it. And that man is, was honored after the war for that, that courage because he took a lot of heat. And I believe after the war he, he, he achieved some uh, level of uh, responsibility in the police department, maybe in the chief or something. But unfortunately, in 1943 or 44, it was bombed in, in one of the Allied bombings. But it's been completely rebuilt. It's where the Jewish center is now. Did and you uh, get to Checkpoint Charlie? We did. We walked uh, Unter den Linden to the Brandenburg Gate and, and through Tiergarten. And what about the Holocaust Memorial? Went to the they have a very moving Holocaust it is, Memorial it is, in Berlin. It is. It's, it's a very different, it's very modern. In it. the, it's, it's all below ground the museum itself, and above ground is a sort of an undulating field of, uh, of rectangular columns. That it almost feels as though you were in a maze. Yes, 
Yes. Which can, maybe psychologically is what they uh, wanted to perpetuate. I think it wants to give you a sense of isolation and dislocation, <laughs> and it does when you walk, walk through it. Then we also went to the Jewish cemetery in Weizensee, where some of my family are buried. Unfortunately, I didn't have their... I wanted to get that information at the, at the cemetery, but there was an Ju- obscure Jewish, Jewish holiday, so it was closed. And then the, uh, several other moving things. We, we went to my father's, uh, I think, one of his last addresses in Berlin uh, on, uh, uh, in, uh, in Charlottenburg. So it was in the western part. And then we went to Sibylstrasse, which was the address where my grandmother was taken and then sent to Auschwitz. We had, my sister learned through the Holocaust Museum uh, when, my, uh, when my grandmother died. We had a, she had a hard time f- discovering that and through some just uh, serendipity, my father was ill and at the end of his life and his sister, my aunt, blurted out that, oh, my mother was remarried I mean, this is, you know, I mean, I, you know, this is 30 things, years of, things of you sitting on know. this information and not disclosing it. So it, we had a name. It's incredible how so many people who endured the experience just didn't want to talk about it and didn't want it to be a part of the life of their children. And yet others became very involved and insisted on taking their children back. Right, but, uh, right. And my father, at, my father actually returned to Germany twice. Uh, he had an uncle uh, who since passed away uh, in the 70s. Uncle Gork, George in English, Uncle Gork, uh, survived the war living in Berlin. And he and his wife decided to stay in East Berlin because he got a pension there. He could have left, but he just stayed. And the story that I had always heard was that uh, Uncle Gork's uh, wife hid him during the war. Now, I learned later, I had sent uh, a request to the Jewish Center to find out about him. And the information I got back, this is within the last several years, that he survived the war wearing a yellow star. And that's almost beyond belief. Well, it is, and and there, uh, within it's also going to be a story for another time. Well, it is. We are running out. I don't know if you've ever here, heard but. of the uh, Rosenstrasse revolt. It's something that, that the got, white roses you're talking about. No, this is oh. different. Rosenstrasse was a, a street in um, Berlin, uh, and uh, they had taken. In the last part of the final solution, they took uh, Jewish spouses married to non-Jews. To be continued, we're talking with Stephen Munzer, oh. and we have run out of, <laughs> if nothing else, time. Farewell, Berlin is the book, and Stephen, nice to meet you. Come back again. We'll finish the story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I was going on, I guess. Yeah, it's a- It's not a tragedy if we go over a few...